Okay, it looks like we're live. All right, excellent. So for anyone who's going to be joining us and watching this later, we're actually meeting with Lauren Bregitzer today. He's another faculty member uh, with me at CU Denver and uh, a huge Ableton user. In fact, uh, he's one of the few certified Ableton users anywhere, right, Lauren? Is that? Uh, Ableton certified trainer. There's about trainer. 300. Okay. There's about 300 of us in the world. Sweet. What does that mean? Tell, like, tell me. It's like I, I've heard you talk about it, but I don't remember all the details. Well, the, the, that's the only certification Ableton has is their Ableton certified trainer. And what they're designed to do or, or what, the, what the purpose of it is just to have someone that's been sort of Ableton approved that can use the Ableton logo go out in, in different in, in the world and say, hey, I'm an Ableton certified trainer. If you need someone to talk to, you know, you can go to this person. So um, it's a pretty strenuous, or it's true, I should say, it's a pretty rigorous process going through all of that. It's uh, um, basically you have to have been like a, an Ableton user for quite some time. You can see this information on their website, but um, and work in an educational capacity where you're teaching people how to use Ableton Live. So you can't just be like a, an amazing Ableton user and get the certification. You have to be working in some, some sort of ed education. It doesn't have to be like at a university setting or something like that. There's actually only a handful of probably two or three university professors that are, are Ableton certified. But um, anybody that teaches in, you know, um, private lessons or, you know, in private institutions, you know, electronic music schools, that kind of thing, um, th they'll all be, you know, qualified to be an Ableton certified trainer. Um, so the process is basically, you know, three steps. Now I can't go into two details because too many details because it's uh, covered under a non-disclosure agreement. But uh, basically the first one is you send in a bunch of like a big application, like you're, it's worse than applying for college. You have to send in a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then they whittle that down to a certain number of people. And then you go for a, um, a phone interview and basically the phone interview you go through and they sort of just grill you over the aspects of Ableton live and they whittle that down. So that's the most nerve wracking part really is, is getting grilled by Ableton employees over Ableton software uh, for an hour. I think for mine, it was about an hour and 15 minutes. It was pretty long. I don't think, I think it was the most I've ever sweat in my entire life. Like my pits were down to here, but uh, I think I, I met with Sam like right after that, after that for a meeting. But uh, yeah, it was the most, most sweaty I've ever been in my life, I think. Um, and then the third phase is you go to their, uh, a location in the U S I went to their U S headquarters in Pasadena and uh, it, it depending on where they do it. Cause they'll have like, they, they search for different trainers in different regions at different times. So they were searching for 10 trainers in the United States. So they did two sessions. Um, they'll do like China, uh, Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, England, Latin America, uh, all, all over the place. So they'll search for different regions when they decide they need some and just come up with these events. Uh, every so often they might do like one or two a year. So that might be like one in Latin America and one in India or something like that. Cool. But it's been, a, it's been a process that it's been sort of certainly well worth it. Cause you get connected with a nice, a, an amazing network of people. That's the nice thing about Ableton is they're very big on community. So they ha they have a lot of support for their users and uh, the, the community as well. So uh, they get a lot of popularity that way just by being, in the community and supporting their, these, you know, independent user groups and stuff like that. So, um, again, I have a nice community of people all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, the Facebook translate button is your friend because you got, you're talking to somebody from Italy and someone from China and someone from, you know, Africa. So you get a big variety of people in there. Uh, how long have you been using Ableton? Were there other DAWs that you've used along the way? I mean, the main, the DAW I've used the most by far is Pro Tools because I spent a lot of time in, in studios and I still use Pro, Pro Tools a lot to this day because Pro Tools, in my opinion, is the best for like tracking and editing and mixing, but it's not great for creating music, although some people do it very successfully. I mean, the best DAW is the one you know the best, but for me, I'm a big Pro Tools user. And the first time I used Ableton Live was, I forget which version it was, but right when Pro Tools... Uh, eh, added the uh, support for rewire uh they came out with you know a disc that had like ableton because ableton would rewire to it. i'm like okay i just want to install it this is like probably 15 almost maybe 20 years ago uh that you know i got this disc i, I loaded it and i installed it. like this is interesting and uh, that was about as far as I, I went with it at that point in time <laughs> um 
I started getting more into it about 10 years ago because when it started out, it wasn't like a full-fledged DAW in that it only worked with audio clips. So it was designed to loop audio and for live performance, as the name implies. Um, and as the years went on, they started adding more sequencing features, added MIDI features, added instruments, and so forth to its a uh, you know full-blown workstation, you know, on par with like Logic and Cubase today, just with this sort of different take of things. Yeah, so I mean that sounds like a lot of the other workstations. Like Logic started out as kind of the the MIDI sequencer and then added audio later. I mean, do you think I, my you said something a minute ago that I kind of uh, I also believe that the the best DAW is the one you know the best. Uh, do you really think that there are any DAWs that you couldn't produce music on right now? Oh no, you know I've seen people put out records on that. What was that Sony looping software they had years ago? Was it Acid. Pro yeah, or? Acid. I've seen people you know hand me records to mix, mix that were that was recorded in Acid Pro. You know that was just this. So, you know, yeah. and it's fine. So, I mean, if you can record audio into it, if you record, record MIDI into it, you know, you can create music with it. It's, I don't think that there's any th one that holds you back, you know. So Yeah. There's been a huge hula-la right now on uh, Facebook and other places about the new Reason Plus service. Have you seen that? I saw it. It's just basically their monthly subscription was like $30 a month, I think, or somewhere around there. Yeah. So, well, I think, well... It looks like it's 20. They may have actually reduced okay, it. Okay. But um, there, it's like tons of people are like, why? I mean, it seems like more and more people are going to subscription models. Pro Tools has done it. Um, Reason is now doing it. People seem pretty upset about that in general. Um, do you think Ableton is looking at any of that subscription stuff? Not that I've heard of. As far as I know, I, I, I think that they like that, you know, um, just just buy it and you have it model and they you know have give you at least three or four years three three to five years of you know updates for that one version i think uh, i haven't heard anything that would that would specifically say otherwise i mean if i did i wouldn't be able to say it but sure i, I guess I, that but, makes sense. but i haven't heard anything that says that they would, would the last i've talked to them uh, because i talked to ableton employees probably at least once a month or so um they, they don't seem keen on that subscription model at least as of yet i mean i don't know what's going on behind the scenes but i mean it, to, to me i'm not a big fan of the subscription model as the only means but i like the subscription model as an option you know to give give consumers more options to on how they want to get their software is fine with me like mcdsp does that where you can buy the plugins or you can get their subscription um isotope started doing that now as well in the past couple of weeks oh cool yeah, I don't know how I feel about it. I know that right now, at least, because Logic is my main workstation for music stuff. But, I mean, Apple, they did their, uh, which version was it that, it's like five years ago now is the last paid upgrade they've done. Yeah, at so least. It's been a while. And I think that at some point they're going to be like, you know, we should probably start you know, charging people for something that they're using here. I don't know. Maybe it's the, you just have to buy a new Mac every three years is their model. And so they're assuming that, that if more people use their software, that more people will buy their, you know, pretty expensive computers. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with Final Cut 10, you know, yeah. you bought one version at about the same time and you just keep getting these upgrades forever, which I think, I think, I think is amazing. Uh, it's, it's great for consumers for sure. Cause even out of the box, I think logic gives you the most bang for your buck for the money that you spend with all the instruments and plugins and effects. And I'll also, as, as a big Ableton user, I'll say this to this day that, uh, um, you know, logic gives you the most bang for your buck by far when you spend that uh, $300 or so, um, yeah. what you get out of it. Um, and, and Ableton has never been a company that, you know, says they're better than anybody else or anything like that. They always, they encourage our, their certified instructors to know as many digital audio workstations as possible. So you can talk intelligently, intelligently about the, the difference between the, the, the users and stuff like that. I know a lot of the certified trainers are also big logic users. So um, there's certainly no like animosity towards logic by any means uh, in, in, amongst the community at all. Well, we feel a lot of animosity towards you guys. Cause I'm just kidding. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, so have you used Logic then? 
I have, but I don't use it all that often. Mostly I just use it to teach my students how to do stuff, but I, I used to use it a lot for sequencing. I mean, I first got Logic when Studio Vision died or, or got shut down by Gibson, and that was about 1999-ish or so. Um, and it was it was still owned by eMagic at that at that time. I remember you know, back then. You know, I was going through Logic, uh, you know, in front of my students the other day. I was looking at the names of the devices. You have you know, you see the words platinum and silver and gold listed on some of the 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 the, the, the plugins. I remember you know Logic used to have those tiers where they had the the silver tier and the gold tier and the platinum tier. And some of those plugins that are in Logic are still holdovers from the, the from that day. Just that, like they have the oh here's the platinum compressor. You know they put a new face on it, but it's still that you know platinum compressor that was there um, you know twenty years ago. Well, and uh, honestly, if you click, I think it's the option key when you go in to add an insert. There's a legacy function that shows up in that case, and you have all of the old plugins still. Oh, really? I'll have to totally do that next time I open up Logic. Yeah, it's uh, uh, still for they're still doing backwards compatibility from from all those years ago. Oh, that's amazing. That's really great. Yeah, it's like the there's the the DJ or the Fatty Q and maybe a DJ. They were both like horrible, but <laughs> they're still in there. And they've added some of the other guitar stuff that used to be there that has been upgraded to new things. There's just like, I think six or 10 different effects in there that are still there from all those years ago. Oh, nice. It's cool. It's actually stupid. I don't know why it's, it's not well, really cool. But. It's, it'd be worth exploring at least to, to, to remind me back what it was back then. But that, sure. that was the manual was like this thick and it was nowhere near as user-friendly as it is today. Yeah. Uh, well, I still, I mean, that's still something that um, I think it struggles with because it tries to be simpler. But I mean, if you like to want to actually do some of the advanced functionalities in there, you, it's like you have to have a degree in it. I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know how really, I mean, I've used Ableton a number of times and actually done some training on it and stuff. But um, I always felt like going into Ableton, it's just like I if I didn't know how to do something, I could just drag something or, you know, figure it out pretty easily. But, you know, in logic, mm -hmm. when someone's using it for the very first time and they say, how do you, it's like, how do you do like the beat mapping thing? And it's like, Oh, okay. Let me start back with the beginning of audio history to explain this to you. <laughs> yeah. So it's like user-friendly, but it's also like deceptively complex at the same time. I mean, yeah. I mean, you have basically like three and a half, almost three and a half decades worth of history tied into that program, and a lot of it's, you know, stu I mean, just dealing with the environment and logic. I remember that was my biggest headache Jeez, back yeah. when it first came out because you had to deal with that with your when you're routing stuff, and that just like my 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 twenty twenty four year old brain was it was too much for it at that point in time. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I mean, right now you can still do tons of stuff in there, but you don't have to anymore. Yeah, yeah, but this you were forced to then. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ableton 11 just came out recently. Um, yeah, just a few weeks ago. What are your favorite ago. stuff about it? Um, one of my favorite things in Ableton Live 11 is they have a, a probably, probably, I mean, they had a, has a lot of quality of life features more than anything. I mean, they added some major things that maybe people always say, oh, they finally added, you know, MPE support and they added, mul finally added multiple takes. Um, th those are you know, pretty big options in there, but a lot of little quality of life improvements I like, like uh, uh, there's a CPU meter on each track. So if you have software synths and sometimes if you, you know, a lot of times, just like in Logic, you have big productions with software synths and all of a sudden your computer's maxing out on its CPU. You're like, what tracks can I freeze to, 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 get the most out of this you know lodge or ableton has a cpu meter on each track so you can see which ones are hitting your cpu the most and yeah, how hard which logic had that for sure yeah but, but uh, it's pretty sure in logic that um there's like a few different things you can do in there that are like the big draws on power anyway yeah. Um, another one I like is the follow action. So I use follow actions on clips a lot where it'll play one clip and you can program it to like jump to the next clip into the next clip. So there's some new follow action functionality and they have a follow action for their scenes where it plays a whole 
you know, horizontal row of clips. And so you can have it play this row and then this row and then this row. So it's great for live performance and stuff like that. It's one of those things that people, I've heard people say, how do I do this? How do I do this for years? There, there's been workarounds where you've been like mapping a MIDI that you program with through with an IAC bus. It's, which was, it, was, it was a big hassle to do that, but now it's like built right in there. Um, to do do those follow actions, there's there's a lot of random randomization in there, so you can you know randomize certain um, notes and stuff like that. But you can also randomize effects presets. So like if I have a big chain of effects, I can put them in a rack, and I can select a few things like a filter cutoff and maybe like a delay time and a delay feedback, and just all across all these different devices, and I put them in a in a in a in a group device. And then I can set it to randomize certain features. Not only that, but I can also uh, program uh, different snapshots so I could have different settings on all the knobs on there and save that snapshot and be able to recall those with just just a push of a button and uh, stuff like that. So you can you can control which ones you want to randomize, how much you want to randomize them. So there's a lot of cool randomization f- features in there because uh, people like doing generative music and stuff like that. And Ableton Live is really great for it's a great for platform for that type of music. So yeah, I actually talking about different workstations. I don't think anybody else does the generative music as well as Ableton does. Yeah, it's, it's it's great for that, um, especially with the incorporation of, of Max MSP or I guess it's just Max sure. now because Ableton bought out Max uh, a few years ago. Cool. Uh, with that, um, with the effects randomization, can you have it randomized to a pattern so that it's like uh, every quarter note it changes to something else randomly, or is it more? Is it something else? Um, you know what, anytime you, you, you ask something like that, like, can I make it ran, randomized stuff every like bar that something like that, that's not baked into the software, like built into it. Um, I can pretty much guarantee somebody's made a max for live patch that does that. Sure. So, there, so I don't know if you, I don't think you can do that straight offhand off of Ableton live. I'll have to look into it, but I know if that doesn't exist in Ableton itself, that you could absolutely find a max for live patch that will actually do that for you. And that's what I think is like the huge disappointment for something like logic because it could be doing a lot more. It has like the, the whole Java code MIDI effects uh, plugin that you could actually write all your own stuff. And that ties into everything. You could do your own environments and things, but we don't have a community. I don't think that's really pushing those boundaries or creating cool things in there. I think most of the people who are doing that kind of creative stuff tend to have gone to Ableton. Yeah. You know, the thing that I think about Logic's strength, the biggest strength is, is, is also the biggest weakness is that's owned by Apple and Apple has a specific way of doing things where they don't like to do a whole lot of third party partnerships. They like to keep everything as much in the box. I mean, I know Logic's had, you know, deals with uh, um, like, like Apogee and stuff like that, where their hardware was designed to work really well with, with uh, logic and stuff like that. Um, Ableton tries to be as open as possible with as many third party partners as possible. Um, that's why they opened up Ableton link. Um, if they ever add Ableton link to logic, I would, I would, I would fall over. Even pro tools added Ableton link. If you don't know what Ableton link is, Ableton link is, is what allows multiple digital audio workstations to synchronize together over one network just by hitting a button. So, mm-hmm. So you can sync you know, your position and MIDI tempo and stuff like that. So people can be performing live on many different devices. So there's a lot of iOS apps, like a lot of the Korg apps and stuff like do that. Uh, Reason does that. Pretty much every pro, even Pro Tools does it now. Um, but you know, Logic obviously hasn't added that. But Ableton opened it up for anybody to use that and add that functionality to it. So yeah, uh, but uh, Logic can uh, you know send MIDI time code for other programs to chase. That's the same <laughs> thing, right? I mean, MIDI, Logic can't even accept MIDI time code to chase other people. They're like, we're never, we don't ever see foresee a need for us to follow anybody else. Uh, yeah, exactly. Logic will never show up as a a reason uh, or a rewire device, but yeah. you can rewire devices to Logic. Uh, whereas Ableton will do both. And well, but now, yeah, I mean, now Reason just gave in and was like, you know what? We'll just make ourselves a plugin so anybody else can use us. Yeah, which is smart because I mean, they had some cool stuff, but they they were they were even more closed than Logic was. Yeah. Now it's like the opposite in some ways. Yeah. Okay, so um, what do you think is next? I mean, obviously, without disclosing anything you may or may not know, but like, what do you hope Ableton will do in the future? 
Um, there, there's, there's a few things that I, I know they've like pulled out of the software because, because Ableton's they're they're big into like, um, uh, uh, they're they're big into making sure everything works really well before they release it, even though things always still have bugs no matter how hard you are. So there's a f- couple of functions they they pulled out of the beta, which hopefully shows up in the near future. Like, uh, you could stacking because you can sequence video clips inside those, um. Uh, um you can stack video clips just like um, you would audio clips, but you can't play those in the session view right now. Um, and when I mentioned those macro snapshots where you can create settings with the different devices and you know recall them with a button, you used to be able to sequence those, and that's not quite in there yet. So I, I foresee that showing up in the next like point one update uh, when it comes out. Um, they, they usually they, they've been really good about adding really cool features on every like point one update or so. Um, so uh, where, do, where, where do I foresee them going? Uh, I, I would like to see a new push. So Ableton Live, uh, if you didn't know, uh, they, they have their, or Ableton has their own dedicated controller. Let me just grab it, see if I can like at least, you know, kind of show you. So they have a dedicated controller like this that lets you, um, you know, program and sequence and do everything in there. I like to see them come up with more hardware stuff like that. that has maybe an audio interface built into it as well. So that, cause as, as it sits right now, it's an amazing, you know, MIDI controller for programming beats and pads. And you can watch really cool people do live performances like Rachel K. Kalia and Thomas Piper. They do really cool performances on YouTube. You can check those out. Um, using the Ableton push, incorporating other devices. I like to see more hardware integration or, or Ableton to come out with more dedicated hardware like this, where they'll have like an audio interface. You know, this the push has been the, the push two, I should say, has been out for quite a while. It's been out, out for probably six, seven years. So it feels like it's that's due for a soft a, a hardware update. I would like to see that. Um other things I'd like to see, I like to put uh, to see it have more things on parody with you know other programs um you know everybody's but was asking for playlists for years you know and they they've, they finally added this this version this update um so i think like this competition with all the different daws and i think logic's the closest one that gives you the most bang for your buck and and power under the hood you know to to, to do more of that sort of stuff but i think when they added more ta- uh, you know different takes I'd like that was great for me. I'd like to, to see them be able to make like tracks inactive because a lot of times, you know, you work on a track and you're like, I don't know if I want this track anymore. So I want, I don't, but I don't want to see it. I want to just kind of like shuffle it over here. I don't know if Logic has that, but I know Pro Tools does. You can hide and make an active a track, um, which I do like all the time in Pro Tools. It's one of those things that I kind of wish, you know, um, stuff like that. I'd like to see more software synths as well. Um, you know, they have, they didn't really add any new, they had added some devices like a reverb device. That sounds great. Uh, some cool, interesting delay type of devices. Um, they, they add some more features to their other devices, but I like to see just more soft synths, um, uh, in there. I mean, I have a couple of really powerful ones like Wavetable is great. Um, they have a really great, uh, uh, FM synthesizer as well. And their sample stuff is so great that logic added some of their sample functions over the summer. <laughs> yeah i mean i actually speaking about that um i put this screenshot behind me on on my screen just because i wanted to get your view on uh logic's edition of the live loop feature this is a, a clear poll on you know fl studio not ableton i'm just kidding it's definitely from <laughs> ableton um but it's um it's a feature that i still i've never used once in logic and i i'm probably going to remain not using it because I, I just don't, I don't work that way. And if I wanted to work that way, I would go to Ableton because I feel like it still is the best at it. Maybe uh, Logics will continue to get better, but um, any thoughts about their live looping and Logic? Um, I, I, I think it's fine. You know, it's, I like, you know, the, the, the fact that they gave options to that, to their, to their uh, customers. I remember reading about those features coming in, in, in Logic and, Okay, and I, I was like, read the list. I'm like, yep, that's from Ableton. That's from Ableton. That's from Ableton. And then I get down to to where they're talking about that new um that, that drum sequence or that that drum sequencer um not not drum sequencer, but like you open up a track and you have the like step that sequencer. The, the step sequencer. I was like, that's what Ableton needs to steal and put that in Ableton because there's no step sequencer like that in Ableton Live. At least that's not uh, a Max for Live patch that would be baked in because. At this point, when you're if you're programming MIDI, you know, you're recording stuff or you're drawing it in in like a standard like style MIDI track. I wish they added that step sequencer like like Logic 
you know, added when they added these other live looping stuff. But, you know, I think that the, the incorporation of the way they work and I, I want to learn how logic uses it a little bit more. I just know that they added it um, because with Ableton Live, it's very baked into it. You like, like you have a mixer and you have two views. You have the, the standard arrangement view, like any other DAW. And then you have that, uh, you hit just one button, you hit tab and boom, you're in the, in the session view where it has, you know, these clips that you launch, you know, the, the live looping type stuff like you have in, in logic. It's, it's really baked into it. And the nice thing is it's so, so well incorporated that, um, you know, it's it's the it's the mode that I typically work in when I start working in Ableton Live is I like to use that as a sketch pad. So, um, you know, if you're using Logic, you know, look up users of Ableton Live to see how they use that their, their you know session view and how they're using loops and stuff like that. And you can easily apply that into Logic for people that are more into like loops and beats and electronic music type stuff, EDM that type of stuff. Um, I think that you know, since those those are very, those features are very similar now between those two DAWs. I think that just as a as a Logic user, you can just go to it. You know, one of the big Ableton user uh, YouTube channels like Andrew Wong's great. Um, there's a lot of other ones out there, um, and see what they're doing. And you're like, oh yeah, well I can do that Logic. That's great. So use those for ideas. I would I would recommend for for your viewers to do. Yeah, I do agree. The step sequencer is probably one of the best things that came up in that update. Uh, just because of how powerful it is in, in terms of not just rhythm programming, but instrument programming. And you were talking about how they added the randomization of, of notes and stuff into Ableton, but that's where they added the randomization of, of notes inside Logic. I wish, I don't know how it is with Ableton, but when you use the, ro the note randomization in the step sequencer, uh, you change the percentage of the randomization and then it writes it up into the region and then it's not random after that which i was kind of surprised i thought i was hoping it'd be random every time you push play yeah with with, with ableton live 11 you can just kind of like draw a box around a certain region and it'll show you in that box what that random range is going to be so you can program in that range and it doesn't even have to be the, for the whole clipping just be for, 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 for a certain section so maybe you know, like have a nice you know 16th note hi-hat pattern or a 32nd note hi-hat pattern and you can go in and, and say randomize a few things like the velocities of this and uh, it'll play back differently each time so uh, before we got on here, you were telling me that there are some things about logic that drive you crazy. Now, obviously, for everyone watching, uh, it's you know it's clear that you're not like a like a regular logic user, but you do yeah. dabble in there. You show students and stuff at the university. I mean, you've used it. Yeah, and I love. What their are those sense. things that drive you the most crazy about logic? Um, well, my my new one was like, cause I don't know all, all the shortcuts. So someone was like, oh, I, how do I zoom in and out really easily? They're like, oh, I just use the command arrow. I'm like, oh, good, a shortcut. I need two hands to use. Hmm. <laughs> so like, oh, good. So so I don't, I need to use take my hand off the mouse so I can zoom in and out. Thanks. Although um, you can customize all your shortcuts. I mean, it's not. Yeah, like that's that's nice. Um, th one of the things that kind of makes me crazy is I'm, I'm using a 4K monitor, and some of their devices don't have a, a high DPI uh user interface so if i open up like that delay designer because i'm like i remember that being kind of cool i open up it looks like looks like hot garbage on my screen right you open up the compressor you open up the eq and like that looks great it's a nice clean excellent user interface in logic and i'm like i open up that d delay designer i'm like what what in 1999 did i travel back to uh yeah they're still updating all those i think i hear a lot of people talking about man why don't they just finish that already yeah, I mean, I, re I really like the compressor, the different uh, modes. I was going through that with my students the other day, and I think they all sound great. Um, but like by default at 100%, the, 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 the plug it opens up, it fills up like a third of my monitor, right? And you can shrink it down, and that's fine too. And that looks good in a small size, um, but except for the text. And then once you shrink it down to like a, a usable size, it's like, well, now the text really small. I got like a lean into my computer to see what's going on. So that kind of drives me nuts. Um, but other than that, I think those are kind of the main things. Uh, some of the defaults that it snaps to aren't like friendly with mastering. Like if I go and I master a track um, and I have you know, headroom, so I have room for true. So my true peak is right on. If I go to bounce, I got to go in and take an extra step and make sure I have like the normalized turned off because that can wreck your RMS or your LUFS level and your true peak level. So um and and I think Ableton Live does a, some the same thing where they 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 kind of make this the program by default as as user friendly as possible and if you're like an intermediate to an advanced user 
uh, that just kind of knows what they're doing. You go in there and you're like, oh, I got to turn this off. I got to turn that off to get you know exactly what I want. You know, like those that functionality is there, but you just got to take an extra step to, to go in there. Where a program like that, Pro Tools does, assumes you, you are an expert no matter what. You open up Pro Tools like we assume you know everything, so we're not going to spoon feed you anything. Whereas Logic spoon feeds you quite a bit. And I think Ableton Live... Uh, spoon feeds you a fair amount as well. Um, you know, there's things in Ableton Live that that are that are dumbed down a little bit as well. Uh, okay, so with Ableton, um, this is going to show like which version I was on last because I haven't used. The, I don't think the last two versions. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, can you do like a conductor track in Ableton now and have the tempo actually change over the course of a project? Oh yeah. That's when that's, did that it, get added in? I'm not sure when that got added in. It was at least in Ableton nine, okay, but yeah, I think it was it, nine. If you're nine working, if you're working in the arrangement view, um, you know the the master track right there. That's where your tempo and stuff would be. Is you know the the, the master the stereo bus output. That track also has your conductor type thing. Now it doesn't have as robust of like, um. I mean, you can draw in tempo changes and stuff like that very easily. Um, one of the tricky things is in the session view, a lot of people don't know that, um, like prior to uh, Logic 11 so, or, or Ableton 11, if you're in Ableton 10 and you're working in that session view that, or like that live loops view, um, people were like, well, can I change the tempo? Can I change a time signature? You absolutely could. You'd have to, pro like in the name of that that scene where you'd launch those horizontal loops, it, the name of that scene, if you typed in the words like 120 BPM, it would change your session to 120 BPM once you launch that scene. And the next one, maybe it's 96 BPM. You hit that button and it changes that. You can do the same thing with a time signature. I put 4-4 four, four in one and 3-4 in another. It would change that when you you know launch that scene. In live, or in live 11, you, you can just drag it over and you can just, adjust that functionality manually in each of those scenes gotcha so it was like some of that stuff was there it was just maybe not as straightforward yeah yeah it's, it's definitely not as robust like you wouldn't do a big film scoring project you know certain DAWs like like performer is really good for that sort of stuff that's why a lot of film composers use I hate uh, performer so per, yeah no I I used to use that in college and I, I, I was done with it <laughs> um and it was like the hardest thing about performer was that the manual was their software key essentially uh, because they didn't have any like digital help files. You couldn't look up stuff on the computer. You had to have the manual. And so if you didn't buy the actual software and get the manual and you, you could never look up anything, it was insane. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, maybe what are like your top two or three things about Ableton that you actually really don't like? Um, what I really don't. There, there are, you know, in a lot of programs, there's like, you know, you're limited by your computer's CPU and your computer's processing and stuff like that with with regards to the number of tracks. You know, I, I'm sure Logic's that way. Ableton Live's that way in a lot of situations. There's the, the what, there's few, there's very few like hard limitations, but one hard limitation is you have a maximum of 12 aux sends. Hmm. So you, or, or, or I'm sorry, 12 return tracks. You, have, you can't have more than 12 return tracks. Uh, there's certainly workarounds, but... Um, it's not as ideal. I like I use a lot of return tracks when working in Pro Tools, so I kind of get that as as a luxury in Ableton Live. Um, but you you can kind of work around it using um, effects racks and instrument racks and on individual tracks. But as far as the whole session goes, uh, you, you have a hard limitation at twelve aux return tracks. Um, one of the other things that that I think is it's a little bit, bit pricey, I would say. I think they offer great like educational disc discounts and stuff like that. But out, out of the box, like live suites, going to cost you, um, you know, over you know six hundred dollars for that. Um, so if you want everything that's in Ableton Live, that's 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 a good chunk of money, especially um, getting into it. Uh, but you know, there's a great student educate educational discounts, and then every now and then they have like twenty percent off sales. But their stuff is a little bit on the pricier side, so that's another thing that I think it should be a little more. I mean, they have three different versions. They have a hundred dollar version, a three hundred dollar version, and like the six hundred dollar version, um, with you know varying amounts of of devices and stuff like that. But I, I would like to see um, that that kind of makes you crazy. But I know it's a business and it, it costs money to run and they they've been for the longest time, you know, f between four or five years between major paid upgrades. And this year, I think they had one that lasted maybe three years. I think, I don't know how live 10 maybe lasted three years, which is pretty quick because nine last five years and eight lasted four years. So 
Um, this is like the shortest jump for for in, into paid upgrades. Um, yeah, you some you were talking about how there's downsides to Apple owning Logic, but I think that this is one of the upsides. That is that is it. a huge upside. That's, because I, you know, I mean they're making like a billion dollars off of iPhones every year, and you know computers and other stuff that they're like, you know what? Whoever bought this the one time, just just use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see if I think anything else like sort of like really makes me crazy with it. Um, I mean, there's always like little things like, oh, I wish I could do this or I wish I could do that, that uh, that's not coming to mind right now. But there are things that you like, I wish Ableton Live would let me do this. But the thing is, is in Ableton Live, because they incorporate Macs, you can, people have usually programmed in devices that will work around a lot of stuff that, you know, maybe the, the core software is missing. Um, so Max, I don't know if your, your viewers know this, but Max is a visual programming environment that was owned by, uh, originally by Opcode and then Cycling 74. Now it's owned by Ableton, but it basically allows you to sort of program any like MIDI device, effects, to, audio effects device, um, video pr- uh, device. Uh, and so if you're big into programming, you can kind of develop those. There's a whole like huge community of, of Max users that create stuff. Um, then they they kind of panicked that, that when when Ableton bought them, but Ableton's ba- pretty much left them on their a, a, on their own to do their own thing, pretty much. That's good, uh, at least. Yeah, I think I think my guess is they probably bought the company so they wouldn't have to worry about like you know contract negotiations falling apart for you know a subsequent version of Ableton Live, and they won't be able to add you know Max for Live because that became a crucial part of Ableton is adding that uh, program environment in there. And the nice thing is you don't even have to program if you don't want to. You can just drag your devices in there, and they and that people have made, and you can use crazy third party devices. Uh, so I don't know if you're lo- looking at any of the comments on the feed. I know um, there's a at least a, there's really just two viewers who are commenting one of them is yak face i i just wanted to give a shout out and thank him for um saying so much anti ableton propaganda on the channel right this moment <laughs> it was a perfect example of what i was talking about how i don't know if it's really true that ableton users don't hate for instance logic users but um there's definitely some some hate going the other way right you know now. there's 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 always a handful of people that uh hate one or the other and usually because Ableton's sort of risen in popularity pretty significantly over the past 10 years um, that there's always going to be people that think well they, 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 I think people try to uh, justify the DAW that they use by bashing on another DAW like people try to justify their iPhone or their Android device because uh, they think it's better than the other one, but I think I, I'm a big proponent of you know use what works best for you um, and what 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 you find the most creative and just why don't you just let everybody else be spend all the energy that you use in hating another digital audio workstation or complaining about it on a forum or something like that and spend that working on your craft you know spend that time doing something productive um, or you know email you know companies that you wish would do things better and let them know. Um, yeah exactly um i do feel like i i'm actually off facebook right this moment except like once a week i go in there and look because it, i'm just tired of all the people who are who spend all their energy bashing whatever it's a lot of, of effort. using it it's like every it's like you should there should be a rule that before you can bash a piece of software that you like release a song that you're working on once yeah. you've spent all the time actually being creative, then you can be like, you know what? And, <laughs> but and the thing for is like, who just wants to bash and never actually create, I, I just don't, I don't have a lot of patience for that. You know, the thing is I've been to Ableton's uh, big loop uh, music summits. I've been to their headquarters in Berlin. I've been to their headquarters in Pasadena. I know a bunch of their employees and stuff like that. And a lot of the big community users of Ableton live. And I have never once heard anybody in the Ableton community bash another digital audio workstation at all never never an employee uh i've never heard anybody say anything bad about another digital audio workstation yeah and I, don't get me wrong especially yak face in the comments you're allowed to bash ableton i mean uh i'm not telling you not to uh, i'm just saying you know it's i prefer the attitude of you know what let them do their own thing and you know focus on your your own music 
um, Matt in the comments was saying he plays music, not Dawes. And I a hundred percent like that attitude more Yeah, where, um, that that's kind of happening for logic. I think we would actually have more users. Um, this came up in the comments too, but if it wasn't just Mac only, yeah. obviously that's the hook that draws you into using Macs, uh, Mac computers, not Macs, but, um, it's like, I can't tell you how many students I have that are like, I would use logic, but I can't afford a, like an Apple computer. Yeah. That, that hurts them in areas where a lot of creative software, like in Europe, a lot of creative software users are, I mean, in the U S it's mostly Mac based for creative users, but in Europe it's different. They'll use PCs more than Macs in Europe for creative software production. I asked Ableton, like what their, what their user base is. And they say it's about 50, 50 between Mac and PC. They said that in the U S it's mostly Mac users in Europe. It's mostly PC users. Um, yeah. So I think that's one of that. I mean, I remember when um, uh, Apple bought out eMagic, you know, in, I don't know, was that 2000 ish, somewhere around there, um, maybe 99. Um, they said, oh, we'll keep supporting the PC users. That lasted about a year or two, and they're like, nope. And, you know, I, I absolutely get that, but um, that does sort of cut their potential user base in, in half at least. Yeah. Uh, I've no a lot of. Um the engineers and stuff I work with in the Czech Republic use Cubase a ton, but mm -hmm. the students there uh, are using uh, Ableton more than, than logic. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and like certain creative artists, like there's, there's, there's a guy I know named Mr. Bill, who's a big electronic music artist. And, you know, he does a lot of stuff in Ableton, but he'll like go in like, Hey, I'm doing a stream in FL studio, or I'm doing a stream in Bitwig or something like that. So he's one of these people that makes great music and really inventive music. And he uses Ableton a lot, but he also jumps in and plays with other digital workstations as well. I think, you know, creators, especially the, the, the more, the more people are into their digital audio workstation, I think the less popular they are. I think I think the big artists, they do what they do in whatever digital workstation they're working on, and they just kind of focus in on their, their, their craft rather than their digital audio workstation. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that it, it really should transcend the tool in a way um, and be more about like the, the idea or the music or whatever that they're they're imagining. Yeah, um, I mean, I always use this as, as an example. Like I had a friend in college and... You know, he would talk to big game about how great a drummer he was. He comes in, has the best, nicest drum set I've ever seen. He took 45 minutes to set it up, and he was the worst drummer I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's funny. I've run into people that I that have had similar experiences with. Yeah. But I've also had someone come in. We literally, like some kid in the studio once, in a previous job, had left their studio in the in our left their drums in the studio like overnight one time and they were like the worst it was the worst drum kit i'd ever heard and um some guy came in we were setting up for another session he sat down and made it sound amazing yeah it's um, about the so player I, not I the think instrument it's not the the instrument or the tool it's what you're doing with it. i think that really is the most important yeah like i told my recording students the, the way to get the best sound in the studio is to have the best player they'll make whatever you know, instrument they're playing through sound amazing, you know, and it's, it's, it's that's, that's what DAWs are. DAWs are an instrument. They're a tool. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's more positive to focus on your craft rather than why my DAW is better than somebody else's. Well, and you know, if you just have money for FL studio, which I used FL studio for a long time, um, I still really like it. They have a Mac version now. Yeah. Um, a lot of hip hop but, people loved FL studio. It, it's cool. It's a different way of working. And my music stunk the same as it does in logic. You know, it's not yeah, like yeah. it made me better. No, no, no DAWs make you any, any, any better. Nope. Um, cool. We have, well, tons of the conversation blew up in the chat. That's for sure. Um, a lot of people on both sides, good comments from everybody. People now just coming in to defend Ableton. Um, they're they're just different and i think we're not saying anything else besides that i don't think that anyone can listen to us talk and and feel like a lot of animosity about it now oh, no. when we're not in a stream together i mean we definitely do um 
We'll, we'll throw some jabs back we and definitely forth throw in some meetings. Jabs, and I think that it's justified and, and, and nice to be able to, to bounce things off of each other. Oh yeah. And we always do it in good fun though. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's mostly good fun on your side. I, I hate, I hate you for it. I'm just, <laughs> um, but it's, it's like you said, it's like whatever you have, just use it so you can do the things you want with it. I mean, um, make music with it. Don't learn every single feature um and like spend all your time thinking if you can just master how to do it that all of a sudden you're going to be like a good musician or something in fact it's probably the opposite with with logic when i if if someone said i want you to work with like this really like mediocre band maybe say like a parent comes to me and say hey my kid is in high school and they have a band and they want to record an album. I'm going to want logic for that recording, no matter what, mm-hmm. because it's like easy to do drum replacement, easy to quantize audio that has flex pitch built onto every, I can like fix tuning. I can fix timing. I can, you know, put in like a bass part that the software is making for me. You know what I mean? So it's like, I want that tool for that. But if I'm working with like a real pro group, I'm going to probably work with pro tools. Cause it, it like stays out of the way. And yeah. It's like everything has a different purpose. Oh, for sure. Now, the one thing I will add is that, you know, one of Ableton's big corporate philosophies or philosophy as a company is that with their software and everything they do, their philosophy is to try to mute, remove as many barriers to creativity as possible. And I, I think that we see that in, in their software and stuff like that. Um, and it's very non-linear as opposed to logic, which is very linear. Um, but that, that's, that's my intake on that. Cool. I think I lost you for one second. Oh, am I back? So we missed like your deep thought there. Oh, oh no. What I was saying is I, that one of the, one of the big uh, philosophies of Ableton they've said is that their goal is to remove as many barriers to creativity as possible. And, I think you see that in the way that their software adapts and stuff like that, but also you know, it appears in some of the limitations as well. Cool. Yeah. You make perfect sense. Well, dude, I think this is about as long as I wanted to go today. This was All super, right. I think informative and a uh, good conversation and the group in who's watching, it looks like they're passionate about their viewpoints, which I love. Good for them. I love seeing pa- people passionate about stuff. For sure. Um, especially music (laughs) yeah especially music especially any kind of music making music um but i encourage everyone not to just you know bash but go out and create and show people if you really believe something's better than something else make something awesome with it and and, you know let your feet do the talking instead of your your big fat mouth yeah Um, absolutely cool well we should do this again sometime Uh, anytime man I'm going to end the stream. Stay on for one second, though. Sure. Bye, everybody.